What happens when two bass road warriors spend quality time talking music and life with one of their peers? Bassist educator author David C. Gross and bassist and head honcho of KnowYourBassPlayer.com, Tom Semioli, trade eights with the legends of rock, jazz, funk, blues, folk, country, and more. Notes from an artist. Revealing conversations with the legends who've created the soundtrack of our lives. What happens? You're about to find out. It's another episode of Notes from an Artist. David, what a thrill it is to have Steve Hackett as our guest on Notes from an Artist, even though the show is pre-recorded and Steve Hackett was our guest. The masses know Steve Hackett as the guitar player for a band named Genesis. He was in Genesis from 1971 to 1977. He is a spry 72-year-old man, and I'd say he looks all about 50 years old, wouldn't you? 70 is the new 50, I guess. Uh, <laughs> it better be. But more importantly, <laughs> what a great guy, a real special person. And it's interesting because you were saying earlier how he used Colin Blunstone, the Seconds Revisited, uh, the Seconds Out Revisited recordings, and the two of them have very similar personalities, don't you think? They're very nice British guys. Well, let's just do a little quick background of Steve Hackett. Again, he was in Genesis from 71 to 77. Some of the records he recorded with them were Nursery Crime, Foxtrot, Selling England by the Pound, The Iconic Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, which, of course, has a New York aesthetic to it, David. Yes, but as I say, I really wish I could have asked him the question, where does the lamb lie down on Broadway? And then who is the lamb that lies down on Broadway. And why Broadway? Why not Fifth Avenue? Why not the Carnegie Deli? Why didn't the lamb lie down at the Carnegie Deli or Katz's? Oh, well, Katz's would have been more than the point. I mean, they would have not only let the lamb lie down, they would have used the lamb shank. <laughs> uh, and, and virtually all the lamb. Right. Except for, of course, his fur. <laughs> Stay tuned for Notes from Our House Live doing Leg of Lamb on Broadway coming up. Also, he uh, was on... <laughs> Trick of the Tail, which is when I first saw uh, Genesis, because I'm a little bit younger. Uh, he was on Wind and Weathering. Wind and Weathering. I, maybe I'm Withering. Sure. Wind and Withering, much like myself. Weathering. Weathering. It's a you, not an I, Tom. Was that Weathering? <laughs> it's you, not I. <laughs> <laughs> which brings us to Weather Report. Anyway, he also did two live <laughs> records with uh, Genesis Seconds Out in 1977, when I was just 17 years old. Son of Sam, if you remember, Summer of Sam. And he also did the early. Yes, you, were, you were son of Sam. <laughs> I was. I admit it. <laughs> a little also, late. A little late. He also did Genesis Live in 1973, which was one of those stopgap records. He's recorded over 30 solo albums as a solo artist. He has maintained a cult status. And I guess you would have to say that along with Peter Gabriel, he really continues on the prog rock aesthetic that Genesis started back in the early 70s. Oh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, both of those bands, it's not odd to think that the original Genesis really was the Steve Hackett and Peter Gabriel years. When they got closer to pop stardom, obviously Steve couldn't hack it. He had to leave the band. <laughs> And Peter oh, had worked already so hard to get that line in there. I know. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> but seriously, uh, that aesthetic stayed with them. But Genesis turned into a basic pop band in the 80s. They did. Not that they did bad music. It just was a complete. In other words, if Martians came down in 1973 and accompanied me to the Felt Forum to see Genesis, and then the Martians came back in 1985, they would have seen that not only did my hair get longer, but that Genesis no longer did 12-minute songs that went through so many different gyrations and, and changes. Absolutely. And of course, we know Martians ruined the neighborhood, which is why you left the Upper West Side. Anyway, uh, but when you, yes, well, I agree with that, that Genesis certainly uh, sans Hackett the post Hackett years, they were more, they're now sort of a relic of the 1980s, whereas the original Genesis or the Hackett Gabriel version of Genesis certainly has more longevity. As you alluded to earlier in 1996, Steve started the Genesis Revisited uh, Repertory Ensemble, uh, which was in the studio and on stage. And David, some of the alumni included John Wetton. A uh, friend of notes from an artist, Colin Blunstone. Ian McDonald, your former brother-in-law. Tony Levin, friend of the show. We've had him on. Alfonso Johnson, Pino Palladino, 
Bill Bruford and Chester Thompson. Yeah, it's amazing. You got your Genesis folks. You got your King Crimson folks. You even got a guy from Weather Report thrown in there. <laughs> so you really have. Uh, an, oh, and folks, as you listen on, I had no idea. I should have. But I had no idea that Steve Hackett really knows his jazz fusion. Absolutely. Steve is yeah, he's a very well-rounded musician. And when you when you review his records, his solo records with Peter Gabriel, uh, Peter Gabriel's solo records. And of course, Peter Gabriel uh, had tremendous hits in the 1980s and 1990s. You'd think that Steve Hackett would have, too, because there's definitely commercial tunes on those records. However, he was with uh, Steve Hackett was with a smaller label, Charisma Records, whereas uh, Gabriel was signed to a major label. So had Steve uh, been on a major label, who knows? He could have maybe exactly. had a few hits, a la Peter Gabriel. And of course, we are talking to Steve on the release of his new record, Genesis Revisited Live Seconds Out and More, which is available on four LPs or two CDs. And, of course, it's also on uh, DVD. So a great package for Genesis fans of all ages. If you are new to Genesis, this is a great starting point because Steve really gives uh, a phenomenal overview, and he's got great players on this record as well. Absolutely. It just came out September 2nd, so it's available now. As a matter of fact, he almost has a hit song because the album – from what he told us, is in the top five in Britain right now. Isn't that interesting, the uh, legacy rockers? And uh, the good news also from Steve is that he is prepping for a uh, Foxtrot revisited. So they're gonna, that's their next project. They'll be here in the U.S. Uh, end of 2022 and 2023. So Steve was in rehearsals. He took time out to talk to us about Genesis Revisited. His career, some thoughts on punk rock. Uh, ruminations on um, on uh, what's happening in the music business then and now. So let's get to Steve Hackett, Dave. All right, now behave Thank yourself, you, David. We have a rock legend coming on. No, I'll never behave myself. Oh, Can you hear me over? Hey, out? Steve Hackett, how are you? Not bad. Not bad <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. Where are you? I am in Teddington, in the suburb of London. Um, okay. Late at night for you, England. There. I'm much. I'm a much rehearsed man. I've been been making a din all day with my band. So I'm. Uh, this is eight o'clock at night for us. Okay. How are you guys? I'm okay for half an hour because I've got another interview after that. I hope that's okay. So that's okay with us. David and I are both bass players. We're working musicians, but don't hold that against us. But, no, 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 I won't. <laughs> Talking about, I want to just uh, quickly ask about you, your book, A Genesis in My Bed. One of the things yeah. I thought was very interesting was the year 1977, when you talked about the punk onslaught and how journalists treated you unfairly. Now, they saw your music and your band like Genesis as dinosaurs, but you were all of 26 years old. Not much of a dinosaur there. How was your relationship with the press? How do you feel about doing interviews? Oh, fine, fine, fine. Uh, I went through a period of, at that time, I couldn't get any good reviews for anything. The British mm -hmm. press had gone very much uh, in the accusatory sort of uh, <laughs> style of things. And I thought I was just trying to establish myself at that point. But they saw me as part of the old guard, you know, an old man of 27 <laughs> at that point in time but you know genesis we did lamb lies down on broadway what was the story about it was about a puerto rican punk we didn't start punk but we were ahead of that trend and where's the word punk come from in literature the first use of the word punk is in shakespeare so he refers to it as a rubbishy person that's the uh, the idea of of punk, you know, as it was in the dictionary of the 1600s. What can I tell you? I was telling Tom earlier that punk really was a, a promotion that I guess came out of Malcolm McLaren because most of those guys actually could play their instruments. And, right. and it was really a scam, if, if you think about it. That was God Save the Queen, the Sex Pistols. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. And I do want to put all my cards on my table. My former brother-in-law is Ian McDonald. Ian McDonald, did you say? Oh, wow. Yeah. That's extraordinary. Or well, the late, great Ian McDonald. I mean, you know, I loved Ian. I think he was aware of that. I was hugely influenced by Ian. And, of course, Ian influenced Genesis. He's a, he's a great loss, and I hope he's, I hope he's in a good place right now. 
I would think so. I'll tell you that I learned more about mixing records from Ian than anybody else. Uh, we would sit in the studio and, and just the little things were just so incredible. He would just, oh, just do that here, do that. It was really quite interesting. And he was a hell of a musician. Keyboard, hard. I know. Sound, woodwind, yeah. Multi-instrumentalist, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Extraordinary uh, level of not just competency, but, you know, the, the writing of the songs as well. That's a rare recording of the Ian McDonald band. He put that together, I was the bass player, after he had left Foreigner. And it's a cool recording called Musical Breakdown. Very rare. And this is Notes from an Artist on SignusRadio.com. And he so, introduced you to the Mellotron, yes, at your, for, uh, with King Crimson, didn't he? Yeah, well, we, we bought Genesis. We bought our first Mellotron off of King Crimson because they seemed to have Mellotrons to spare. I think they called this one the Black Bit. <laughs> it was painted black and it made an incredible sound. It was extraordinary. Right. That was Watcher of the Skies from the Foxtron album by Genesis. This is Notes from an Artist at CygnusRadio.com. I did a little bit of work for, for Mellotron a few years back, and uh, instead of them paying me money, I asked them to give me the tapes, the violins, just the violins before it went through the Mellotron. So we have the cleaner. It still sounds Mellotronic but it's the sweetest sounding Mellotron string you can get. And all the other sounds, I think we really want Mellotron flutes to have that grainy quality that we heard from the very first time we'd, we'd heard um, Strawberry Fields. Yeah. In fact, I was talking to somebody yesterday saying when they first heard it, they thought it sounded like a calliope. The Beatles, Strawberry Fields Forever. Let's get back to our interview with the great Steve Hackett. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. And, of course, the other really characterful sound, Mellotron Brass, is something that can just take your head off. And uh, it mixes so well. All of these sounds mix very well with with um, with rock instrument. They're very characterful. We we come back to them time and time again. Sometimes we mix other things with them, other modern samples, and sometimes a whole ton of, of, of other instruments to have them as part of the orchestra. They don't replace orchestras. They're part of the orchestra. That's how I see them. It's part mm. of the orchestral colours that you have at your disposal these days, whether you're getting in a, a violin virtuoso or you're, you're using that alienated strange distorted sound recorded in 1953 the three women in the bedroom in new york state somewhere uh who characterized who played the um those mellotron strings at the beginning so they're nearly as old as me, those Mellotron tapes. That was Steve Hackett and his Genesis Revisited Band doing the classic tune Supper's Ready live at the Hammersmith in London. This is Notes from an Artist at CygnusRadio.com. Talk about Genesis Revisited. You started Genesis Revisited in 1996, yes? I went back to it. I wanted to do some re-records um, right. of, for instance, Watcher of the Skies right. um, from Foxtrot, 50 years, 50 years old. Uh, this year, I'm, I'm going out doing that album. But when right. I was first talking about the idea of doing Revisited, it was Julian Kolbeck who came up with the idea after we played a, a thing with basically piano and guitar in um, in Sicily. We were in Palermo. And he came up with the idea and he, and he thought its real future would be live. Uh, but first of all, I said, what I would like to do is definitive versions, as far as I'm concerned, of these of these songs and I thought, let's go to town, let's hire an orchestra, let's have a Mellotron and an orchestra play, playing side by side. So what you hear on that revisit of Watcher of the Skies is uh, you've got a Mark II Mellotron playing and you've got the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra playing along with it as well. So um, in a way, there's a sort of fanfare-ish aspect that goes with that. So I, I did that whole album, and, and I, I wanted to use guys who I'd worked with and played with in, in different situations, and guys from bands that were were hugely influential. There was Tony Levin, there was uh, Bill Bruford. I'd worked with Bill before. I hadn't worked with Tony, but, but Peter Gabriel had, had worked with uh, with him, and that that was just great, you know. And Ian McDonald was in the first one, wasn't he? Yes, Ian Ian was on that. Yes, John Wetton, well. I think Chester Thompson. Yes, Chester Thompson, absolutely. 
uh, Alfonso Johnson. So it was a dream team. It it, it was it was something. I, I I went to town on it. I thought that if there's all these musicians who've been involved with hugely successful bands, and uh, what would be their take on my old band's uh, uh, um, musical expressions? So we worked on that. I, I, mm -hmm. I knew that they would bring something to it, not so much reverence to the material, but variation and um, uh, loved working with John Wetton on that, the late, great John Wetton. Mm -hmm. We're talking about fallen brothers here. You know, we talked about Ian or, yeah. or brother, brothers-in-law, as it were. You know, <laughs> I considered them both to be brothers, um, absolutely loved them to bits, you know, uh, these guys. And um, uh, it's it's hugely emotional for me, the fact that they've gone or departed this world as we know it. And that level of, of commitment to to music just means that, that, that in my mind, that, that they must be refined in some purer spiritual state, it, it seems to me. It, it, it's music that, that, that drove them. That was a live recording with Steve Hackett, Ian McDonald, and John Wetton. The first was the Genesis tune called Firth of Fifth, and the second was the Ian McDonald composition, I Talk to the Wind. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. I saw you guys, uh, I guess it was the first time you played the Fells Forum in New York. Uh, what was that, like 71 or 72? Or, or might have been, I don't know, it was probably 73, right before I went to music school. And one of the things that Tom and I talk about is how a lot of American jazz students really copied what was going on with the frog scene at that point. And, and I found it really interesting that frog rock is so patently British, the, the, the classical aspects of it, the, uh, the, the beautiful chop of it, but there's also Shakespeare in it. Uh, one of the things, you know, you guys, you guys started the English language, so fucking <laughs> Had some sort of reason with it, and it seems like you guys were doing some very fantastical ideas lyrically on top of this great music. Well, it seems to me fusion was born out of a bunch of international musicians. Certainly, the New York scene was 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 part of that. But then you had Miles Davis, you had um, Joe Zawinul, you had so many people. A Ayeto Moreira. And straight away, right. you know, you've got Eastern Europe, you've got uh, Brazil, you've got all of these places that are coming together with the idea of inclusive music, I think. So where does fusion stop and progressive begin and where does world music start and, and all of that? And so you've got all the labels, but at the end of the day, you're either open to all of these influences or you're not. And, and um, the wonderful thing about music is that sometimes you can't speak the language of the man that you're working with but he'll communicate something to you via his instrument and you'll find a commonality you invent a third language somehow because you you have to you you have to understand what he's trying to do and uh, bend in his direction and sometimes you have to put ideas of professionalism to one side in order to allow things to happen things that you would normally control as a writer that you would expect from yourself but you have to allow spontaneity and let their personality come through so sometimes you have things that you record and you have to incorporate them or find some sort of framework to allow all of this new blood to come through that was miles davis from the great album on the corner the tune was One and One. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. When you started putting together this repertory ensemble, what was it like for you to go back and listen to something that you recorded 20, 30, 40 years ago? I can tell you, David and I, when we listened to something, we recorded David 20, 30 years ago. Were you right. very impressed with how good we were or... It's what the hell were we thinking? It's a funny thing because I've been working on understanding the whole of Foxtrot from 1952, which is right. is 50 years old this year, as I said. And for instance, there's a track that I'd never played live, and it's the second track on Foxtrot, and it was called Timetable. And it's a very gentle little nostalgic track, full of whimsy, and it's something that has... Oh, my goodness. It hasn't got an American feel, but some, somehow 
there's something in there with the use of instruments and i found it absolutely delightful to go back and do um a um an authentic reproduction of this thing where the whole band were virtually not being rock musicians but playing at cabaret level in mm. order to, to um support the vocals so it's a very gentle little song maybe that's t a too pejorative a term to say cabaret with this but it's electric but nobody is pushing it that's the thing i got a little hint of distortion at one point on the guitar but it's closer in spirit i think a beetle track beetle meets henry manzini that was timetables from genesis off the foxtrot record and this is notes from an artist on cygnusradio.com well you've got john lennon's approval so there, we got know. Lennon's approval, which um, I've been listening more and more to that, that there's uh, an interview that it, that he gave and said there were two bands that he considered to be true sons of the Beatles. And one of them was ELO. And I can understand right. that totally, as I'm a big fan, as it happens. And also, interesting for Genesis, he said Genesis was the other band that he thought were true sons of the Beatles. And I would never have, have, have realised that he engaged with it. But when I listened closely, I realised there are little stories and narratives and quirky things, you know, wordplay and social comment meets futuristic and science fiction and it's hugely rich that album foxtrot is is hugely imaginative i think you know it's going backwards and forwards like a time machine and um i'm very proud of it we're going to go out and play the whole the whole thing uh, deep in rehearsals i've been spending long hours relearning everything breaking it all down but finding that I, i'm enjoying listening to the originals not i wouldn't say they couldn't be improved on because i do nothing but trying to improve on whatever i've done whether it's something recent or, or in the past you know you go back you re-record you rewrite there's no such thing as writing it's always rewriting you're always improving if you can so i'm i'm working with different guitar tones and different boxes and and stuff ah you know today i, I think yeah, I forgot to have the treble booster switched in. Why didn't it sound quite right? You know, a little bit too boomy. Then I, I read, yeah, 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 that that gets rid of that. Something Brian May said about his treble booster cleaning up the sound. And I understood totally today what he was talking about, the, um, uh, the treble booster cleaning up the sound, getting rid of unwanted overtones, the boomy stuff. Well, of course, the advances in technology, it's probably a lot easier to store Foxtrot in 2022 or 23, if you're planning on it, than it was in 1970. Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. It's, it's. I, I wouldn't say it was easier to play now because you have to be on your metal to yeah. play the uh, the stuff in 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 the first place. But over and above that, yeah, I I think um, we had the technology to be able to reproduce everything extraordinarily accurately, but then add other things too. If we want to add other samples, we can do that. We sometimes add real brass or real woodwind. So um, the spirit of something that may have been orchestral or brassy or whatever, we can we can make that happen. As I say, you know, it's it, it, it sounds very good in the rehearsal room today. It was sounding absolutely mighty, absolutely lovely, and I I can't wait to get out in front of people with a light show and, and everything. So that's going to keep me busy for the next year. That was Steve Hackett with his Genesis Revisited Ensemble. The tune was The Musical Box, and this is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. What's the feeling that young audiences are embracing Genesis, again, just as, let's say, David and I did almost 50 years ago? That you're reaching well, a new audience. I think because they rediscover the Beatles, you know, I'm okay. constantly hearing that three year olds enjoy the Beatles and, and people's sons and daughters because they are it's a wealth of songs and technology, yeah. you know, that's un unrepeatable because their stuff was highly characteristic and idiosyncratic and, and hugely imaginative. So as you can gather I'm a huge Beatles fan. I'm just starting to watch Get Back, the movie. What are your together. opinions on it? Well, I've only watched it a tiny bit so far, and I, I'm interested to see where it goes. I thought it had a great beginning, you know, okay. the idea that, you know, editing that stuff in was, was great. But I think that what I'm trying to get to is young people, a young audience will discover Genesis in the same way that they discovered the Beatles and the way young people discover stuff that went on a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, and 
beyond. That was Carpet Crawler's Genesis from The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. Genesis Foxtrot was made by a young musician, so hence it That's should, right. it should uh, appeal to a young audience. Extraordinary players on, uh, on Genesis Revisited Live seconds out. Obviously, the first Genesis Revisited, you had some of the people that were there, but how do you go about choosing who's going to be in, in your ensemble for these uh, repertory? Uh, tracks you're making? Well, I've been working with uh, some guys in the band for a very long time. Um, right. The guys who have not changed are Roger King, because he's a, an incredible keyboard player and engineer and producer and all, all of these things, written film music, and he was trained as a cathedral organist. So, And he's another Bach fan. So, yeah, I mean, perfectly capable of p- playing the difficult Baroque stuff. Highly trained. Nobody's yes man. He, he's um, extraordinary. He's really very, very, very clever. He's become a real pal. Rob Townsend, who is probably the world's best soloist, it's extraordinary. He's a jazz professor, uh, but basically he's a fun guy. So, you know, we vibe off each other like crazy. Spontaneous stuff, his schooled stuff, but he's got such creativity. They're both very creative. Then, of course, we have Nad Silvan in the band, who's Swedish. The other Swede is Jonas Rheingold, incredible virtuoso, and Craig Blundell on drums who, you know, just beats those things to death every time. And um, he's extraordinary. It's an incredible band. They are extraordinary. Some people who've been in my band previously said to me, this is the best band you've ever had. I thought, yeah, well, let's see if I can... Hold it together. Keep it together. Well, one of the things I also liked about uh, what was sentimental, as I bought seconds out the first time around, is you maintain the album cover art. You uh, replicated. Yes. Yes. And I was just saying to David, I hope one day Steve Hackett will replicate this record cover. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah why not? <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. Now, that's a pina colada you're drinking on there, David. Have you? When's the last time you saw a major recording artist put a pina colada on their record cover? I had a pina colada. It was was in was in Florida. So uh, um, where they do great pina coladas, of course. But um, yeah, that was my second pina colada. I'd just been out on, on a Boston whaler, uh, piloting that around uh, around Bermuda. And um, I love that. You know, it's just basically a rowboat with, a, with, a, um, with an outboard motor. And uh, I was buzzing around with that. Great fun, enjoying myself. And I just came back and I thought, I'll have a drink and I'll have another one. And then a photograph was taken. And um, <laughs> What was the song? If you like Pina Coladas, oh, the song, right? Yes, that's right. I, I do remember this. I remember. Yeah, who did? I think yes. that was Phil Collins who did that song, David. I don't, well, I don't no. think so. No, <laughs> yeah. someone, something about Pina Coladas in the pouring rain, and uh... that was Rupert Holmes doing the Pina Colada song. This is notes from an artist on CygnusRadio.com. All right, Steve, we have to let you go in another five minutes. Yes, one I'm question so sorry we have... about that because I have another one to do. We, one question we want to ask you, we ask all our artists, and especially since you're doing album scores, do you think the, the, the long-playing album as we know it, whether it's on CD or vinyl or one of these uh, eight tracks, and I'm sure you still yeah. get royalties from that record, um, is the album format still relevant in the 21st century? Well, I think that albums change the world. Maybe you have to be a musician to realize that, but when I was growing up, an album was a highly prized thing. So. I don't think a gem is, is, is no longer a gem because people say, sorry, diamonds are out of fashion. At the end of the day, if you regard something like uh, two Beatle albums come to mind straight away, Revolver and Sgt. Pepper, you know, for me, where I consider that they're the absolute zenith of their cre- creativity, developing and marching on into the future with that. And then in the cause of the Crimson King, I, I would happily go to my grave if I had nothing else to listen to, thinking, yes, what you've got here is a fusion of of a number of ideas. The classical world meets the pop world, meets the jazz world, all of that. And and that's it's hugely important that we're able to mix those things together. So if you're saying, you know, singles, you cannot get across in one single all of those influences. Music needs time to breathe. So I think that for me it's hugely important. If someone says no, I'm sorry. I would rather watch a film DVD with music accompanying it. That doesn't give me the idea of the true visual, visualization 
of the music. If a song is going to break my heart or fire me up, I'll want to have my own pictures in mind and the echoes of my own experience with the song of Lost Love or something truly exciting like the Stones doing I Want to Be Your Man. I just remember hearing that for the first time, hearing that guitar ripping, and I thought, ah, yeah, this is the first time guitar sounds truly alive for me. This is the best electric guitar sound I have heard. When you listen back to it now, it doesn't quite have the same effect as riding a, a Harley Davidson, but it was it was it was that for a young teenager. Suddenly the vehicle has arrived. That was I Wanna Be Your Man by the Rolling Stones. Actually it was written by the Beatles. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. That rocket, it's firing on all cylinders. It's just the power of music. When will you be coming to America? All I know is it's next year. Uh, no, sorry, I'm coming back at the end of this year. I'm still going to do some unfulfilled dates for Seconds Out. So there'll be some Seconds Out. There'll be some stuff from Voyager, The Acolyte. We're fulfilling those commitments because we were due to go to Canada and Roger King caught covid Mm. and we couldn't do it so we had to start a week late so we come back do some canadian dates and some american because we've already been in america this year to support those so we don't lose a ton of money because of the cost of freight so it's it's a chance for people to get another crack at seeing uh seconds out if they want to do that and it's it's riding high in in the english charts here it's next to ed sheer and in the charts so it's gone to number five which is oh wonderful great yeah, you're a pop yeah, star. Yeah, you're a pop star again. Okay, a pop star all over again. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I, you know, I'm only. I'm, I wish I was 27, but you reverse those figures, <laughs> and the, the absolute <laughs> truth. So I have to run, guys. But thank you so much. For your all right, Steve. Thanks for talking. Good Continued success, sir. Bye bye. You too. Thank you. I want to thank Steve Hackett and my partner in crime, Tom Semioli, for another fantastic interview. The good news is Steve will be touring with his Genesis Revisited Ensemble soon, so check them out when they come to a city near you and pick up the just-released Seconds Out and More Genesis Revisited recording. Also, if you would like to re-listen to this broadcast or want to revisit other Notes from an Artist broadcasts, you can find every one of them on the Notes from an Artist podcast, available with all of the major podcast sites. We look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great one. Take care.